many of us, how many of you use the app on your phone for the, your Bible as a whole now, mostly? Mostly, yep, some of you. How many of you use a tablet? Anybody use a tablet? Yep, some use a tablet. What else is there? Like a written word? How many of you still use a written word? Yeah, it trumps. Let's hold it up together. Let's say it again. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I will never be the same again. I will never be the same again. In Jesus' name, amen. Don't open it up yet. Would you bow with me? Father, I thank you again that you made a way for your spirit not just to be with us, but in us. I thank you you qualified us to be one with holiness. And I thank you, Holy Spirit, that when you came inside, you pulled the veils off of our mind, you pulled them off of our eyes, you allowed us to see and understand your word with a clarity that a mind of the flesh never could. I thank you that you have prepared every heart for what you're going to do today. Before we begin, Holy Spirit, I invite you to take literal possession. My mind, my mouth, every part of me, take total control. I only want to say what I hear you say and do what I see you do. And with the authority you've given in the name of Jesus, I bind up every demonic bird that would seek to snatch the seed that is going to be sown, and I command you to release every person and be outside the walls of this building in Jesus' name. And Father, I thank you again that you will be powerfully speaking words that are not going to come out of my mouth. Your word tells us that your sheep hear your voice. And I thank you today that you will be speaking into the hearts of those who have ears to hear. Let them hear it, let them capture it, and let them be changed by it. In the powerful and the beautiful name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody believing and expecting said, amen. I got to tell you, last week when I began the message talking about um, the one scripture and asked you where, or first of all, who it was who said it, uh, do you remember how many people knew who said it last week? Zero. It's really true. Uh, I don't know how many of you have thought about that since last week, but I thought about that since last week. And I thought, how the heck is it possible after all the years and all the whatever that nobody knew it? And so I got to tell you, that challenged me. So because of that, I'm going to ask you again this week. I'm going to, huh? Genesis 50. You didn't even know the question. That's awesome. What's the next thing I'm going to say, Ron? Yeah, there we go. So the statement was this. The statement was made, what the enemy intended for evil, God turned it and worked it for good. First of all, who made the statement? Joseph. We all know that now. Praise God. After one week. Hallelujah. That's like kids coming back to school in September after the summertime and the teachers recognize they have forgotten everything. They got to start over again. So they begin afresh and then they learn it. Where is that verse found? Ron, what, do, you, do you know where it's found, Ron? Genesis 50, verse, verse 20. Exactly right. Would you turn there with me? Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. And if you have a felt pen, I invite you to underline it. I invite you to put stars around it. I invite you to do whatever you have to do so next time a pastor asks you where it's found, you will know where it's found. Verse 19, Joseph said to them, Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Last week we talked about Joseph's life. We talked about the difference between hindsight people and foresight people. We went through and we talked about a number of different things that Joseph had inside of him that empowered him 
to succeed at what he did. In fact, the scripture says this, Joseph succeeded in everything he did, beginning from the bottom of the well until he got to the right hand of Pharaoh, and after that, he still succeeded. Why? Because God was with him. And then we talked about Joseph had one thing at the very beginning that held him all the way through. What was it? He had a word. He had a word. This morning, I need to give you something. Uh, didn't get at it last week. Holy Spirit has been speaking to me about it all week long. I need to give you a word this morning that I believe for the days that are coming, and next week I'm going to share a little bit about what I believe is coming in the next number of, number of weeks, months, and years. But I need to give you a word so that we have it. Would you write down with me, and some of you might know this off by heart. How many of you know Romans 8, verse 28, off by heart? Don't look it up. Don't look it up. How many of you know it off by heart? Just raise your hand high. Raise it high. All right. All six of you. That's awesome. I would encourage this to be, if you have a list that you put down to memorize, I would encourage this to be one of them. And I believe as we end today that this will be a word that God will give you for the things that are coming. For some of you, it's going to come tomorrow. But for all of us, it, it is what is coming down the road. Romans 8 verse 28 says this, For we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who are called, who have been called according to his purpose. Let me say it again. We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. I want to break this down, and I would like you to write down a few things with me. Would you write down, first of all, and we know. What Paul is saying, and he's making a statement, and he's assuming something in the lives of the believers, he's going, what I'm going to tell you, you already know this. He's not assuming that they haven't heard it before. He's not assuming they've forgotten. He's going, and we know, we know this. I'm going to say to you really clearly right now, you may not know what I'm going to share with you, but at the end of this, I'm going to look at you and say, and we know. Now I want to flip the other side of this. When a person doesn't know something, what does that mean? What does it mean? You're ignorant of it. You got nothing to work with. I want you to think about what is it that the enemy planted inside of Eve's mind in the garden? What did he do? What did, what did, she, what did he plant in her? A doubt. Can I just say this to you really clearly? I want you to think of something inside of you that you know, that you know, that you know, that if somebody came to you and said, no, that's not quite true, it's this over here, you'd go, you're lying, you're flipping face off, because I know this. What I know, you cannot move me in. What I know, you can lie to me all you want, and it makes no difference, because I know it. If I don't know it, guess what? I am vulnerable. Now, we're going to talk about Adam when we get to heaven and go, Adam, how come Eve was not solid in what God told you, in what you knew? There's a reason why the enemy didn't go to Adam. Do you know why? I believe he went to Adam. Adam would have said, no, 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 I, I know what God said. Don't try and mess with me. But let me just say to you, if we don't know, the time will come when we begin doubting. I want to tell you, there was going to be a pile of believers in the latter days that are going to struggle with doubt. I want to tell you something that challenged my heart as a young pastor. We had a pastor's conference in Elbow, Saskatchewan. I had Elbow. Elbow, Saskatchewan. Put it on your prayer list. I was the pastor one year. I went to the pastor's conference. There were pastors there who were already retired pastors who had been in ministry longer than I'd been alive whole group of pastors that were there. I, I got to tell you something. I led a devotion that morning, and, I, and I, God laid in my heart and said, 
when you are a pastor and you've been in ministry for years and years and you are older and mature in your faith, I ask, what are the things you struggle with? Because I said, when you're older, when you're mature, when you've walked in this for years, I said, you're at a different level. You're going to be hit with things different than you are when you're down at this level where I'm at. Can I tell you what astounded me? Some of the senior pastors in that place who retired, they looked and they said, this is the time to be honest. They broke it open. One of them said, I am struggling with my salvation. I have not doubted more whether I'm saved or not than I have in these latter years of my life. I am being hit and struggling with, am I even saved? One of the senior pastors broke open and went, I never struggled with this before, but now that I'm older, now that I'm out of ministry, now at this age, I am struggling with purity in my mind. It's never been an issue. I am battling like crazy. One of the pastors, older fella, and let me tell you, by this time, we're, we're in tears. The senior pastor is in tears. I mean, it was a holy moment. One of them made a statement and said, I am struggling that I am, I feel like I'm absolutely useless. I feel like God cannot use me. I feel totally ineffective. I feel like I have no purpose. Can I ask you, what were some of these men missing? When you know that you know that you know, when there is something that you know and the enemy comes and lies to you, there is no room for movement. If you don't know it, you are vulnerable. Can I just say to you, if there is areas right now that you are not solid in in your faith, which is the shield of faith, if that is not solid, the fiery darts will make their way through and we will doubt and we will battle. Let me give you one. Do you know that you know that you know that God loves you the same as he loves Jesus? Do you know that in such a way that nothing could shake that? If not, I'll tell you. You're going to get hammered. And the enemy is going to cause you to doubt. I could list off a thousand areas this morning. There is only one area that I want to list off. I would like you to write this down. Number one, the Apostle Paul is saying, and we know. What we're going to look at, he's going, we know this. There's not an issue. There's no room for doubt. There's no room for temptation. You know this. He's going, you know this. You'll know it by the end. Would you write down number two? That in all things. Would you underline the word all? I love this. I studied Greek when I was in university. Can I tell you what the Greek for all means? All. I studied a little Hebrew in university. Can I tell you what the word all means in Hebrew? All. Okay? This is not rocket science. In English, the word all means all. Here's what he's saying. The Apostle Paul says, we know, we know this, that in all things, not in some things, most things, in certain things, he's going in all things. We know that in all things. Can I ask you? Does all include the passing of a loved one? Does all include losing your job? Does all include a COVID pandemic that shuts down the world? Tell me what all does not include. Does all include when Peter is hanging upside down on a cross being crucified? Does that, is that included in the all? is all included when you have a disciple that is being sawn in two because of their faith. Is that included in the all? Can I just say this to you really clearly? What the Apostle Paul is saying, 
right now, there is not a single thing that you and I could list off between now and when the rapture happens, there's not going to be a single thing that happens in our life. It doesn't matter. And, and can I just say, some of us are going to see prison before then. Can I just say that to you? Some of us are going to be in prison before the rapture. Some of us are going to resist some of what the government is going to want to be doing as they begin to put the clamps down on churches and on believers, getting us to a point where we're going to be asked to do things that we're not going to do, and we're going to go, you know what? I'm not going to do it. That's asking me to cross a line. My faith is not going to cross that line. And what? You're going to throw me in a fiery furnace? Really? Okay. That was not a deterrent for three young men who would not bow when they were asked to do something. They had a belief inside of them that goes, in all things, what? I love their statement. They go, our God can deliver us from that furnace. We're, we're not scared about that. But then they said, even if he doesn't, even if he doesn't. I'll tell you why I believe the Spirit of God wants us to get this nailed down as we begin heading into this time, because there's going to be a pile of believers if they do not know that in all things, in every circumstance, doesn't matter where they are, the bottom of the pit, behind the camel, in, the, in a prison cell, doesn't matter where they are. Can I just say this to you too? Some of us are going to be falsely accused before the rapture. Some of you already are being falsely accused that you are a racist. Some of you are already being falsely accused that you're a bigot. Can I just tell you, if we hold on to the truth that there's only one way to salvation, and I want to say really clearly, we talked about it Thursday when Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way. Can I tell you, that is not going to be popular, and there's going to be a price that people pay. Here's what the enemy will do with most people. When they're called to make a decision or a statement, they're going to go silent. Most believers will go silent. Because if they're silent and say nothing, then it's kind of like, well, then there'll be no consequence. Then, then they're not going to dislike me, and then they're, they're not going to beat me, or then they're not going to put me in prison. You know, as long as I'm silent. The moment you open your mouth, can I just tell you, I learned this as a pastor, the moment you open your mouth, you're like a gopher with his head out of a hole. And they begin shooting. Believe me. You look at any pastor who's got stuff online, there is people shooting at them. You talk about Kenneth Copeland who goes, I don't even read all the shots that are taken to me online. I don't even read that. In fact, his statement is, why would I read today what's going to be in the bottom of a birdcage tomorrow? I love that. I love that. But I'll tell you, you open your mouth in a coffee shop, you open your mouth and you make a statement about, no, no. There isn't five different ways to salvation. No, that place across the road. No, that's not one option. No, just being a Jew is not an option. No, being part of this faith is not an option. There is one way. Either Jesus lied or else he told the truth. I believe he's telling the truth. Can I tell you, that is not going to be popular. But let me say this. There is not a single thing between now and the rapture that you and I will encounter that is not included in the all. In the all. He is going, we as believers know that in all things, let me tell you when that's tested. When you're standing beside the grave of a spouse that is lost or a child that is lost, in all things. Would you surround that word all? Would you surround it? Would you star it? I challenge you to memorize that word. The Apostle Paul is going, believers, New Testament believers, I want you to get it so thickly inside of you, it doesn't matter what comes in everything, in all things, in all things. Can I just throw one out to you? Would you write down 1 Thessalonians? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18 says this, in all things what? Give thanks. I want you to tie these two together. In all things, you know that God's going to work for good, but in all things, if you know that, in all things, you can give thanks. How do you stand beside your child's grave and give God thanks? How do you do that? How do you stand beside your spouse's grave and give God thanks? I'll tell you, we watched it. I heard it. 
How do you find the disciples being beaten for their faith and locked in prison? And what do they do? They start worshiping, giving God thanks. Why? Why? Because they know that in all things, God is working for my good. I want to say this very carefully. All you got to do is throw someone a little bit of trial, struggle, tribulation, and just ask them how they're doing, have them open their mouth, and very quickly you will find out whether they know this truth or this truth is not present inside of them. All it takes is just a few steps. Just throw a little difficulty. Throw someone a flat tire in a busy day and just find out what comes out of them. Throw someone a crisis, find out what comes out. The Apostle Paul is saying this as believers. We know, we know that we know that we know that in all things, in all things, let's look at the next one. God works for what? Works for the good. I thought, first of all, just really quickly, I thought after six days of creation that God stopped working. Isn't that biblical? Did God stop working? No. Can I tell you what Paul said really clearly? He says, we know that God is continually at work today. God is continually at work in your life and in mine. In every circumstance, God is continually working. And I just want you to write this down. Would you circle this? He is working for what? For the good. Just write that down, for the good. In every circumstance, God is at work for the good, for the good. Let me just give you the flip again. In every circumstance, the enemy is working for the what? Working for the bad. Working for the evil. Working for the negative. In every circumstance, God is working for. Can I just ask you, those of you who are married, have you ever experienced the enemy working for the evil in your marriage? Taking a little stinky, little tiny word that was spoken, and all of a sudden there is a bonfire that is burning, that is seeking to burn down everything that years have built? We know that we know that we know that we know that the enemy is working for our negative, but we know the greater power, what? Wins. We're not going to talk about it today, but I believe the Apostle Paul wants to really remind us again that God is bigger than the devil. Do you think we sometimes forget that? Why is it that lots of preaching makes the devil bigger than God? Let me tell you one statement that did that. The devil made me do it, right? Really? I'm a child of God, born again believer. The spirit of God is inside of me. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead, and yet the devil made me do it? Really? We've talked about it before. Do you remember Andrew Walmack? After 20 years in their house of having one room locked in their house where they could not go in, he eventually, he got fed up with it. He left, went to Bible school, was in ministry. He got fed up. He went home. He opened the door of that room that had been locked for 20 years. Imagine a room being off limits in your house because it was possessed for 20 years. He opened the door. He walked inside. The Lord opened his eyes. He saw the demons in that room. He said they were about four inches tall. He said our family had made them like they were giants. He said they were four inches tall. He walked in. He spoke to them. And he commanded them to leave. Those little imps, he said, left that room. And after 20 years, that room was free to be used again. Can I ask you this question? How big is your God? What Paul is saying is, in every circumstance, God is working for our good. Why is it that we forget that? Everything that's going to happen between now and the rapture, and next week we're going to talk about some things that are going to happen between now and the rapture. 
Can I just share this with you? If you are expecting a cruise ship ride between now and then, next week might be a wake-up call. Jesus said the world hates us. And as it gets darker, do you think that those of us with the light are going to stand out more? We've tried to blend in very well. We've tried to make it so that we don't stand out. We've tried to make it so that people, people like us and, and not dislike us. We, we, we tried really hard to blend. Can I say to you, the day of blending is coming to an end. The day of blending is coming to an end. But if we have the ability, if we have a word that says it doesn't matter what happens, God is working for my good. He's working for my good. We talked about it last week. Joseph in prison on a trumped up rape charge. Was God working for his good? Would you write down number four? The good of those who, what? The good of those who love him. Can I just say to you, that one line there has a major separation going on in the church today. I want to ask you a very dumb question. Are there people who go to church every Sunday who do not love the Lord? Yes, there are. If there is a single indicator in the Bible as to what identifies a person as loving the Lord and a person who does not love the Lord, if there is a single indicator, what does the Bible say it is? If you love me, you will obey me. If you love me, you will obey me. He goes, if love is present, there will be obedience. Just Would you just write this down? Jesus said this. John chapter 14, verse 71. Just, just write this down. Just write the verse down. We'll look at it later. It said, the world must learn that I love the Father and that I do exactly what my Father has commanded me. He says, the world must learn that I love him and I do exactly what he commands me. Any question about Jesus loving God? No question. And the way it was identified, Jesus goes, the world will know that I love him when I obey him, exact his commands, I'll obey. What God is saying here is, Paul says, God will work in all things for our good, for those who what? Love him. I want to tell you straight up, there are believers who do not love the Lord. There are churchgoers who do not love the Lord. There are those that God speaks to and asks them to do things, and they refuse to do it. Why? Because they do not love the Lord. Let me ask you a very clear question. Do all things work together for good for those who do not love the Lord? Do all things work together for good for those who do not do what God has called them to do? They don't. Somehow there is a belief that we have that we can walk in disobedience, we can walk in the flesh, we can walk in whatever we want to do, we can do our own thing without ever inquiring of the Lord, without ever finding out what he wants us to do, and somehow God is still going to be working for our benefit and for our good. Let me make it really clear. You come to work for me, and you walk in the door and say, I'm not going to do what you tell me to do today, Mr. Boss Man. I'm going to do whatever the flip I feel like doing. Do you think that day is going to go good for you? And yet I'll tell you honestly, the body of Christ is full of that attitude. Let me tell you in very clear what it actually means to love the Lord. There's people who really get hung up in the whole concept of fearing God, the fear of God. 
Can I just tell you the fear of God really is a love for God. A fear of God is the genuine love of God. That's what the fear of God is. Don't confuse it. Those who love the Lord actually walk in the truth of the fear of God. We know what the fear of God is. There is a God. He's smarter than me. In everything I inquire of him, and when I find out, I do it. That is the fear of God. That is the love of God. If you worked for me, you'd walk in in the morning and you'd say, okay, call. What does he want me to do for you today? What's my job? What's my assignment? And I would tell you what it is that you are needing to do. You would go off and do it. Can I ask you a question? Do you think there are believers who never show up in the morning and go, God, what do you want me to do today? God, what's my assignment? God, what's your will for me today? Do you think there's believers who never ask the Lord what their assignment is? The Bible says, and I want to say it really clearly, it says there's going to come a time when many people who call themselves believers look at Jesus and go, actually, they're going to go, Jesus goes, not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord. He's going to look and go, I don't even know you. We've never talked. You never inquire. I've spoken to you, but you haven't listened. I've asked you to do these things, but you refuse to do them. He's going to look and go, yeah, you may have been in this church for years, but I don't know you. And then you wonder why things have not been working for your good. In all these circumstances, you wonder why. He goes, just drop it down to this one here and goes, it's for these that this promise works. Look at the last part of it. Did you write number five? Who have been called. I don't want you to answer this out loud. We talked about it a little bit last week. But I want to ask you a question. I want to ask you what calling is on your life. Is that rain? Liquid sunshine. Wow, I'm glad I'm in here. I'm not going to ask you out loud. I'm not going to ask you to, to identify it. Would you just do this one thing for me? If you are crystal clear on the call that God has on your life, would you just raise your hand? Just put it high in the, in the air. You're crystal clear on the call. Okay, put your hand down. If you have struggled going, God, what is the purpose for which you made me? What is the calling on my life? Would you just raise your hand, would you? If you've ever struggled with that, just raise your hand, would you? Yeah. Can I, uh, can you hear me over that? That's loud, eh? I want you to think about this. Thank you so much, God. I want you to think about this for a second. And I want to say this really clearly. One of, the, one, of the major, one of the major lies that has infected the body of Christ, it happens with young parents. Young parents, when they're raising their children, you've heard me say it before, young parents say to their kids, and their kids are smart, their kids are gifted, their kids have ability. They look at their children and they say, you know what, you can do whatever you want to do. If you want to be a doctor, if you want to be a dentist, if you want to be a teacher, if you want to be a farmer, whatever you want to do, you can do it. Can I ask you a question? Is that biblical? Let me ask you, who created you in your mother's womb? Who created you? Did God create you by mistake, or did he create you for a purpose? Did God's purpose say, you can do whatever you want to do, or did God's purpose go, there is a reason why I created you, I have a purpose for you, and until you find that purpose, there will be unfulfillment in your life. Let me tell you what Ephesians says. God created you for what? God created you for good works prepared what? Beforehand, ahead of time. 
Can I say, when God creates an individual, he says, there is a purpose. I just want to say to young parents here and listening, every young parent should be crying out to God and going, God, what is the purpose for which my child was made? Would you help me to direct them to find that so they're not floundering for years or get to the end of their life going, I have no idea what my purpose was. I have no idea the calling. I gotta say this, it's really crazy. Do you know that in Russia, by the time a child finishes grade four, the government has already determined what track they are going to go to and spend the rest of their life. By the time they're finished grade four. They know whether they're gonna be a doctor, they know where they're gonna be a factory worker, they know wherever they're gonna be. By the end of grade four, they already have that child pegged, gifted, where they're gonna be on their track. I look at that and I go, if a communist country can do that, How much more should we as the body of Christ, how much more as we as parents filled with the spirit of God be able to cry out for our children and go, God, I'm not going to ever say to them, you can do what you want. No, that's not what it is. It's God created you. There is a reason why he made you. We're going to do everything in our power to help you find that, sweetheart. Can I just say to you, there is a calling on your life. There is a calling on your life. This is what he is saying. He says, we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called, who have been called. Let me just make one big general. How many people are called to be in the family of God? All. Let me just correct one theological issue that's out there that divides the entire body of Christ. There are those who believe that some have been predestined for salvation and some predestined for damnation. It doesn't matter if you preach to them. It doesn't matter what happens. You're destined for hell, and that's where you go. You're destined for heaven, that's where you go. What are they called? What are those people called? What's the theological belief behind that? Calvinism. Just write that down. Would you Calvinism? In the 1500s, one went one way with Luther, one went one way with Calvin. Calvin said, you are predestined either for heaven or hell. Nothing can change it. Predestined. Some who are called and some who are never called. Can I just say this to you really clearly? When Jesus made a statement and said, it is not my Father's will that how many sheep be lost? It is not my Father's will that one sheep be lost. Not one. Can I say that opens the door? The calling of the Holy Spirit is on every person. The heart of God is for every person to be saved. That's the heart of God. How many will respond to that? How many will? I wish they all did. The Bible says the way is wide that leads to destruction. The way is what? Narrow that leads. Narrow. I got to just show you this. You know what? It's so much easier to be the devil than God. How many degrees in a circle? 360. Do you know that the devil has 359 ways to cause you to miss the one way? One way to salvation. 359 other ones that he can use to cause you to miss it. Even if you are right beside it, can I tell you, you still miss it. That is why it is a miracle when a person is born again. That is why it is a miracle when a person comes to faith in Christ. It is an absolute miracle because it's impossible. I want to just ask you one question this morning. If the call of God on your life, if the purpose for which you were made is not clear, what would be the best thing to do? Ask him. Inquire. Find out. I want to ask you a really dumb one. How many of you, when you're growing up, your parents said to you, there is a purpose for which God made you. Our job is to help you find it. How many of you had parents like that? Just raise your hand, would you? Raise it. Yeah. If it didn't happen in our parents' home, if it didn't come from them, are we stuck? No, we're not stuck. I just want to say one thing. There's a lot of seniors who feel that once they've reached the senior year that they just need to put in time until Jesus comes back, so... 
nothing against fishing, but let's just go fishing. Fishing is great. Can I just say that? Right? Gardening is great. Can I say that? I mean, none, none of those things are wrong. But somehow it's, it's settled inside of older people that once we're older, that our purpose is kind of coming to an end. We really can't do this. Can I tell you, there are some people out there whose ministry did not begin until they were retired, and their ministries exploded. They had far greater ministries in their senior years than they ever did before they retired. Tell me, what does the Bible mean when it says that our leaves never stop being green? The sap still continues to flow. If you are a senior and you want to be in a church where all they do is cater to you until you, you go to be with the Lord, you're in the wrong church. Because the truth is, there is a call on your life. As long as you are breathing, there is a purpose for which you have been made. And when you're walking in that, God goes, I will make everything work for your good. Outside of that, there isn't a promise. Let me show you the last one. Would you write it down? Number six. Would you write down according to what? Whose purpose? According to his purpose. According to his purpose. A number of years ago, when we did the funeral for Earl Green, friend, do you mind if I mention a little bit of the funeral? God laid in my heart that at the funeral, I was to take two ladders and stick them up at the front of the church. Some of you were there. We know the old statement that people get to the end of their life, they get to the top of the ladder, and they go, wow, my whole life is leaning against the wrong wall. I've spent my entire life building a kingdom and it wasn't the kingdom of God, they find out they missed it all. The question is, we talked about this on Thursday at the funeral. There are two things that last for eternity. What are they? The word of God and the souls of men. There are two things that last for eternity. God says this, he says, if you're a person who loves me and have been called according to his purpose, God, it's not my purpose, it is your purpose, God, what is your purpose in my life, the calling to build your kingdom, not on my own wall, God, what is your purpose? If that is not clear, can I ask you, what, what guides you every day? If that is not clear, what is it that determines your decisions every day? And if that is not clear, does the promise that he gives that in all things will work for your good, does that apply? God is saying this. Not just in the latter days, but in every days he's going, I have created you for a reason I want you to find it, and when you live in that, all of my promises will surround and protect and make it work for your good. What was the call on Joseph's life? To save his family and the entire nation of Israel. Do you know why? So that Jesus could be born. That was his purpose. Did that mean that everything in his life worked for good? That's what it meant. How do we find that? Next week, I got to share with you what I believe some of the things that we're going to encounter between now and the rapture. I wish they were all going to be positive and all going to be good. 
But I do believe that as we go through this time in our life, whether it's a year or a hundred years till Christ returns, there are things that God wants us to know that we know that we know so that we will not be moved. We'll not get off track. 